So good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Um, and welcome to Commute Programs for the Return of the Worksite webinar. I'm Kate Meredith, I'm Vice President at Commuter Services, and I'm joined today by Michelle Leonard, our Outreach and Programs Manager. Good morning, Michelle. I'm trying to amp the slide. There we go. So just a um, couple of quick notes before we start. We are recording this webinar and we will send the link to the recording and the full slide deck um, to all attendees and registrants in, in, within a week. Um, and then we will take questions at the end of the presentation. So throughout the presentation, if you come up with questions, please just put those in the Q&A tool uh, and we will get those answered at the end. Any questions after the webinar, um, please reach out to me, that's my email, and I will get back to you and happy to have a conversation. Um, and it helps if you just keep the questions or comments in Q&A, then we have one place to look. So if you could refrain from using the chat option for that. All right. So just a little bit of an overview. I think some of you might be familiar with commuter services, but just in case not, just to give you a little refresher, um, commuter service has, has worked with employers and commuters in communities of Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Edina, Minnetonka, and Richfield. We are the outreach program of the I-494 Corridor Commission. And that was established in the mid eighties to address increasing traffic congestion along the corridor. Um, so interesting to note that there are more jobs in this section of the 494 corridor than anywhere else in the state of Minnesota, including Minneapolis and St. Paul combined. Um, I'm sure you've noticed if you travel in the area that, that there's heavy traffic at times. Um, and in fact, according to MnDOT, residents from 85 out of the state's 87 cities um, counties actually travel this section of 494 every day. Um, and they're going to destinations like the mall and the airport besides employment destinations. But of course, two years ago, the commute for hundreds of people changed dramatically as companies sent staff home in accordance with the um, state of Minnesota stay at home order. Um, today, many organizations are poised to bring staff back to the work site. And we also realize that many companies never sent staff home. Um, or they have had employees back to the work site for a while now. Um, and while telework will still be a factor, survey results from our surveys um, have indicated that, um, you know, the commute will not be as, as carefree as it has been in the last couple of years. In fact, we see indications that many people who previously used a sustainable commute mode now intend to drive alone when they go back to the work site. This is a concern not only in our area, but across the United States. We also know that we have an opportunity now as commuters sort of reset their commute and go back um, and think about how they're gonna get to work that we can give them you know, encouragement and resources to help them think about not driving alone for that every day that they're driving to those, getting to the work site. So this webinar is a refresher on um, some of the programs offered by commuter services for both employers and commuters. The resources that we cover are completely free. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now to Michelle, who will give us a brief overview of the recent commuter statistics. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start this morning with a statistic that we received from the Association for Commuter Transportation. Um, ACT is an international organization and the premier transportation demand management association for our industry. And Commuter Services is a longtime member of ACT. Um, in a January 13th podcast called Between the Lines, and it's produced by a TDM company called Commutify, um, ACT's executive director, David Strauss, shared this fact. 
it was that only 40% of the people in the workforce nationally have jobs that can be done by telework. And the remaining jobs are on site. And that's 60% that require individuals to travel to the work site in order to perform their duties. Um, these on-site jobs are at grocery stores, hospitals, gas stations, industrial parks, hotels, and so on. And those individuals are the ones who have been the commuters that have been on the roads primarily for the past two years. And which is all this is to say that telework has had an impact nationally on the commute um, and locally too, for that matter. But it telework itself has really not and probably will not be the primary mode for most people long-term. So we'll start off with some local numbers to give you some perspective about what's been happening in our area over the last six months. Um, as you may or may not know, you, uh, Commuter Services regularly surveys commuters and employers. And we've done these over the last two years to kind of monitor, among other things, the impact of telework on the commute. And as you can imagine, we've seen a pretty significant rise and fall um, about telework itself over the past two years. Two years ago in February or prior to the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, our surveys show that only 5% of all of the commuters that we were surveying were teleworking full-time. So it's 5%. And then that number skyrocketed to 78% during the initial stay-at-home order. And now it's kind of gradually fallen back to the point that in our latest survey, which was in December of 2021, 46% uh, said that they were still currently full-time telework. And long-term, we see that that number is going to drop even more. So we wanted to narrow this down and really give everyone a good picture of how many people would be teleworking full-time versus having a hybrid arrangement and what that, what telework would really mean, full-time telework would really mean to the commute going forward. So last July, we started to ask, we started to ask our commuters what their expected long-term work arrangement would be. And what you're seeing on this slide is the chart and it's a, it's a culmination of responses from both July and December when we asked the same question both times. And the telework, the full-time telework numbers are at the top. And as you'll see in the blue, going forward, only it's, it's an average of 14% of our respondents that expect to telework full-time long-term going forward. And this is, this is actually an increase of only 9% from where we were at two years ago. But when we looked at that hybrid number, that's the big one in the middle there, um, to no surprise, hybrid is predominant and will be predominant going forward. More than half of our commuters said that they will work hybrid and most are planning to commute to the work site two to three times per week. Now, um, when you look down under that hybrid number, you see our, our responses for our full-time on-site numbers. And that does, you, there, is a, there is a difference there. Um, our average is 24% of commuters that respond to our surveys who said that they are on-site full-time. And that is below the previously cited 60% net of the nationwide average. Um, we suspect that, that statistic, our statistic is lower than actual because the survey is distributed electronically and some commuters in that permanent on-site demographic may not receive it in this format. 
or um, they may be working with um, in, a, in a business or in industry that we just, we haven't been able to establish a relationship with yet. So um, we'll move on, I think. And then we have, we do have 10% who said in both cases that they just weren't sure what their long time arrangements will be. So then we kind of, going back to the hybrid thing, we, we kind of took a look at the days of the week and how hybrid will affect the day-to-day -day commute. And now we're knowing that most hybrid workers expect to be on the road two to three days per week. We wanted to gauge what that effect might be on the daily commute. So our chart on the left is the compilation of expected daily trips. And that's for, uh, that is a compilation from the July and December surveys. Um, these are results that show us the busiest days for commuting after companies bring staff back to the work site, even on a part-time or hybrid basis, will be well, there's peaks and there's valleys. So, so we've got, um, if you look at Tuesday and third, or Tuesday and Friday, you can really see what this difference is. There will be twice as many commuters on Tuesdays as there will be on Fridays. That is 60% on Tuesdays and 27% on Fridays. And if you've traveled the work to the work site lately, you may have already noticed this difference. Uh, we've had people comment to us that they are noticing the increase in traffic along the 494 corridor on certain days. So then we looked at the chart on the right where we kind of break out um, who is going to be making up that traffic. And the blue, the, the predominant blue there is the hybrid number. And the green represents our on, the on-site full-time. And as you can see, hybrid will make up most of the commuter traffic on those three middle days of the week. And the on-site traffic, on-site full-time traffic will be, or already is, more predominant on Mondays and Fridays. To give you an idea of this impact, hybrid, 57, I'm sorry, 57% of the commuters that are on the roads on Tuesdays will be hybrid, and 35% will be the on-site full-time. But then you look at Friday and that ships and it's almost a direct, it, it, it's almost exactly the same. Friday that shifts to 56% who are on, of the commuters being on-site full-time commuters and the 33% is hybrid. So Based on these survey results and um, the predominance of hybrid, we, we know that there's no real cut and dry method for us right now to project the impact of hybrid drive alone on the daily traffic. But we, we position, we're of the opinion that it would be incautious to not assume hybrid will impact the daily commute. Um, the, impact of hybrid will have to be examined more in depth in, uh, going forward and we will continue to monitor that. So the last thing we wanted to talk about though in regards to this hybrid is that um, because we saw so many people that were saying they were going to do the hybrid drive uh, or the hybrid work arrangement, we looked at um, how they were going to get to the work site when of the hybrid people, how they were going to get to work to the work site. And um, keep in mind that the this was in December, and at the time we were all cautiously optimistic that we would be returning to um, the work site in early 2022. So the numbers 
what we're projecting here or what we've seen here might not be happening right away next month, but it, I feel like it's safe to say it's indicative what, of what we see coming. So the slide here says that 52% of our people who are hybrid plan to drive alone when they have to commute. Another 20% will have that hybrid arrangement, but they did not specify what their commute mode would be when they go to the work site. And then we have 18% who will use a sustainable commute mode when they go to the work site. And we have another 11% who say that they will drive alone some days, but use a sustainable commute on other days. And we are encouraged that nearly a third of our respondents plan to use a sustainable commute at least some of the time that they go to the work site. But again, we have to be mindful that the 50, we do have that 52% who say that they will drive alone and we have another 20% that we just don't know how they're going to get there yet. Presumably, many of them will drive alone. So in this too, we also looked at the reason that our hybrid workers are telling us that they want to drive alone when they return. Um, the first three uh, that with the, they're gonna be more comfortable in their own vehicles. They have concerns about social distancing and um, that they're concerned about cleanliness and all of this under the umbrella of health and safety. and, and Absolutely. Um, those are um, those are things that we attribute to, you know, just our own personal safety part. But then the other two reasons, the last two reasons, with the carpools and vanpool changes or their transit routes have been canceled or, or changed, um, you know, those really are circumstances of the past two years. So I'm gonna wrap up my comments here with this slide. And um, I wanted to point out, it is worth noting that we are not the only region in the US that's watching and waiting to see how the commute will change after return to work plans are implemented. This is an industry-wide concern among TDM providers nationally. And I had mentioned earlier the statistics from the January 13th Between the Lines podcast. And I wanna close with this quote that the ACT Executive Director, David Strauss made in the same podcast, because I, I just think it is so moving. If we allow near-term concerns about health and safety, which are rightful concerns, to enable folks to make a permanent shift to driving alone, we will have congestion and air quality conditions that are worse next year than they were before the pandemic. That is a real concern of ours. What we know from our surveys and what we are still learning about hybrid will affect the daily commute going forward. We at Commuter Services thought that now would be a good time to review some of the programs and resources that we have available for employers and commuters. Um, we know all of you likely have many decisions to make in the coming months. And um, when you're ready to talk about sustainable commuting, we're here for you. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Kate and she'll go through our programs and resources. Thank you so much, Michelle. That just provides some some good background. And I know that you've many of you have probably seen the employer and commuter surveys go out and and it gives us a lot of valuable information. So keep on filling out those surveys. So I'm going to go through um, you know so, a, a real high level of the resources and programs and give you ideas and strategies for um, encouraging you know, as much non-drive alone commuting um, as possible as we transition into more employees coming back to the brick and mortar work site. Um, so this is starting a conversation, hopefully will we'll give you some, some questions and thoughts and we hope to continue the conversation after today. So um, we are very happy to give you guidance on setting up commute programs and incentives that work for your work site and your location and your company culture. 
Um, we strongly recommend, and several companies are doing this that we're working with, incorporating um, commute resources information into the return to the worksite planning and communications. So as you are thinking about and sending out communications to employees about lo the logistics of returning to the worksite, um, incorporating the commute into that because you know commuters see their their daily commute as an extension of their workday. So it makes sense to, to start talking about that at the same time. Um, and we have a great opportunity, as I said before, before people sort of get re in, in their routine of how they're gonna to get to the work site on days they don't telework or full time, um, you know, to, to give them ideas and encouragement. Um, we can customize employee communications and we'd love to schedule a meeting with you to, to kind of work, walk through some of the customizations that we can provide. There's more information about what we can provide for employers on our employer page of our website at 494corridor.org. So here are some strategies um, to think about. And um, some of these are things that we've done in the past and, and we're also open to new, new things, but they're things that have worked for us. And I think we they will work in the future as well. So one of the best ways to reach um, your employees is to host a commuter fair. Usually these are in person. Um, it's a really effective way to just give customized information and answer questions. Um, a commuter fair is open house style, typic typically held in a lunchroom or common, common area that has a lot of traffic. Um, and we, provide all the materials and we help you promote the event ahead of time. And we just need a table. So make it very easy. So if that isn't really feasible, you wouldn't be ready to do that right, right when you are bringing staff back. We can do an electronic, what we call an e-fair. So it just describes all the different resources and has links to, to our website for your employees to request all the information. So we're happy to do that as well. Um, a lunch and learn seminar is something that you could think about as well. It seems a little old school, but it's something that can be live streamed. It can be recorded. So it could be posted on your intranet or sent via email to employees that they can attend an actual session. Um, but it can be about different things, different things that might work for you or that you're interested in. It could be an overview of commute programs and resources. It could be about construction projects. It could be around a specific mode like carpooling and vanpooling, sort of a matching event, or it could be a bike community webinar. So there are different topics that we can um, help you with with a lunch and learn. We encourage you to offer fun incentives and competitions that make sense for your workforce. Um, it can be just encouraging as many employees to um, you know, use a sustainable commute mode within a certain month or a certain other period of time. So we can help you with, with ideas that work for your work site and culture. Um, Communer Services has regular prize drawings. We do monthly prize drawings. And at other times of year, we do larger, longer try it campaigns. So the idea is that we are encouraging people to do just one day where they are not driving alone and they can enter to win some prizes and we give them ideas and, and incentives. So that's something that we encourage you to relay to your workforce and we can, we can put that in an email or we also include our prize drawings in, in our newsletters. Um, and we have promotion of commute options for you know, your various tools, whether it be a, a newsletter, internet posts, blogs, a direct email. We are happy to create um, copy for those communication tools. Um, we also have commute information for new hires. There's certainly been a lot of shifting with staffing, but I know definitely companies are, are doing some hiring. So we have information for new hires. Um, you can sign up for our quarterly employer newsletter. We're gonna send one out this week actually. And we have a monthly commuter newsletter. Um, we can also offer a display of commute services materials and um, up we have a poster as well. So this is a, a large display. They're not typically this big, but 
um, we have tabletop displays and um, wall hanging displays. And we can also, again, provide all the information electronically. So um, I'm just gonna go now into kind of by mode, some of the resources and strategies to think about. Um, I'll first go through bicycle commuting. Um, these are some things that, that we think would be good ideas. Um, you could hold an on-site bicycle safety check. So this is just a time for, um, for employees to bring in their bike and you can get it checked. And it's a free service that we facilitate. Um, we also can bring in a presenter on how to bike to work that gives the basics of um, what to wear and planning your route and, and all of the things needed to make bike commuting successful um, for the non-bike commuter or someone who just wants to try it or just getting started. Um, you know, bike commuting is really ideal for employees that live five to 10 miles away. Um, and offering bike amenities is really helpful as well. Commuter services can provide a free outdoor bike rack. So it holds six bikes, it's a starter rack, but we've given it to hundreds of companies and properties and it's, it, you know, it, it's an it's a important thing that employees will, will need when they bike to work. Um, we also encourage if possible to provide indoor um, bike storage, like that room that you see that picture or covered storage outside. You, have, you see some parking garages um, that are fully enclosed and those are, those are more high end, but um, just wanted to give you that sample. We also encourage you to offer bike repair materials. So for um, quick repairs of your tires or patch kits, tools, um, we're seeing more employers offer those things. And you can see on the bottom picture, there's a little tower that has some of these uh, bike repair station. And some employers have the tools in like a bike room as well. Uh, we have uh, information about how to put your bike on the bus and train. We have printed materials for that, but we also have an actual rack that we can bring out. And it is a rack that is on the, the front of every um, bus. And we can just show, show your employees how to put, your, put their bike on the bus, which can be very intimidating. Um, we, we take our demo rack to community events and we're happy to bring it out to an employment site as well. Um, Another thing that is sort of a, a, another level um, to promote bike commuting is you can purchase bikes for employees to use over lunch. So sort of a free loaner program. Um, we have some companies that provide that and it just is, is a nice thing to answer the, the barrier that if someone is you know, carpooling or taking transit, they don't have a bike at work um, and they wanna run an errand or grab lunch, they have the freedom to do so with a bike that they can check out for free. So now I'll go into um, transit updates and resources. So the number one resource that we encourage employers to consider is offering MetroPass. It's deeply discounted. It provides unlimited rides and it's only available to, to people um, through their employer. Um, more than 300 organizations in the Twin Cities offer this valued benefit to their workforce. Um, and organizations need just one rider to participate. So if you have just one bus rider, you can enroll in the program and, and pass on the discounted bus pass to the employee. A MetroPass costs um, $83 per month per person and employees pay through it via payroll deduction on a pre-tax basis. So they're saving that uh, money and transit pass programs have no cost to the employer unless they choose to subsidize. And more than 80% of participating companies subsidize transit benefits and they can earn tax credits. So MetroPass um, is a great deal to start with, but you know, if you can offer it at a better discount, that's even better. And, and then you can earn tax credits as a company. Um, you probably are aware of the Metro Orange Line, the BRT. Um, service that recently started at the beginning of December. Um, it provides frequent, um, mostly all day service from Burnsville up along the 35W corridor, connecting downtown, South Minneapolis, Richfield, Bloomington, and Burnsville. 
um, the orange line replaced routes 535 and 597. Um, and it's, it's important to note that um, there was a study and there are many bus routes that were enhanced and restructured so that they have uh, good connections to the orange line and it improves transit service along the whole corridor. So west and east and, and south. Um, and we have you know, detailed information about that connecting bus service, but it, it just provided more direct and frequent service to connect to the orange line. Um, so Metro Orange Line is a service of the of Metro Transit, but we do partner also with um, Southwest Transit and Minnesota uh, Valley Transit Authority. So we stay up to date on the new routes and services for all of the um, providers in our service area. Um, and just in general, you know, there is new um, and improved transit service. Understandably, during the pandemic, the last couple of years, there had to be reduction and in, in elimination of some routes, but um, some of those routes are back and there's a focus on, you know, the, the most um, ride it, the, the, the routes that um, are very popular. So um, we're happy to see that, you know, there was, there's restoration of service and um, we're hoping to see of increased service in the future as well. So in talking about safety measures, um, we, you know, we do hear from commuters and from employers as well, just concern about safety on transit. Um, one way as far as COVID goes and also as far as um, just personal safety. So we do you know, definitely track what um, the providers are providing for, um, for, for instance, for the, for the COVID-19 safety measures, masks are still required on all transit per federal mandate, and all vehicles are cleaned, um, disinfected daily. Um, capacity limits are no longer in effect, but riders are encouraged to spread out while on buses, trains, and stations and stops. Um, and with regard to personal safety, several measures have been taken, for instance, by Metro Transit Police, which is a full service 24 hour licensed police department. Some of the um, initiatives include community service officers, a dedicated staff monitoring cameras on transit vehicles, a homeless action team, and a text for safety um, feature. So there's been a lot of attention and resources um, aimed at making transit, I know, a safe option for people. Um, and I won't go into all the details, but if you have questions about um, safety measures on transit, we're very happy to answer them or get them answered by our partners. Um, we can provide, uh, again, trust customized um, information about the transit service for your work site. Um, we can provide you with physical schedules and maps and collateral materials and a display with all that information. So contact us and we will get you the information that you would like. Um, so I'll go into carpool and vanpool programs and incentives. We assist employers and commuters in the formation of carpools and vanpools. Um, there is a regional ride matching system that we send a link to any interested uh, commuter and they can get matched up with people in their home area who have a similar commute and schedule. There's no obligation for them to contact the people they get matched with or to start carpooling or vanpooling, but it gives them um, the list of folks. And we also have tips on setting up a successful carpool. We can create maps for employees to see how many people live near them. And we, we can post those up um, at the employment site. It's a nice visual and it starts conversations about ride matching and ride and carpooling. We can facilitate meetings to gather employees by home location to help form carpools and vanpools. And, and we also provide carpool and van pool preferred parking signs and we manage the program for you. So, um, so we have um, registration process and we send out permits and we kind of handle all the logistics for you to be able to provide a spot close to the front door for your carpoolers and van poolers. So I'll go into um, Metro Van Pool. And this is an option that is ideal for longer commutes. Um, 
now um, you can start a BAM pool with four people, it's sort of officially five, but with um, you know the, the situation in the last couple of years, it is, it is down to four people. Um, the lease agreement is between the primary driver and commute with enterprise. Um, the lease includes really everything that is needed to operate the van, uh, maintenance, repairs, liability insurance, roadside assistance. Um, it doesn't require long-term commitment. You can, riders and driver can leave the van with 30 days notice. Um, and Commute with Enterprise has done a lot to, to address safety concerns. Um, they have a complete clean pledge. So it's a starter kit that is on every new um, van pool and includes a spray bottle and, and gloves and masks and, and all kinds of things to keep the car clean. And, and there's encouragement that within the van family, um, you know, the group shares responsibility for cleaning the van pool every day. Um, and what's nice about having a smaller group that's in a van pool is there's the level of assurance and accountability to one another. Um, you can share driving and again, cleaning and maintenance responsibilities. Um, employers can also set guidelines on their own and it's up to them to do that. And we have some examples of employers who, you know, for the safety of their employees have set um, additional guidelines for van pools, like temperature checks each day. Um, you could potentially do regular COVID testing amongst the, the van poolers, um, limiting the riders for the vehicle so there are fewer people in the vans um, and requiring face masks at all times. So there are different things that employers can do to, um, to keep the van pool safe and keep the van poolers safe. Um, one of the things that we track as well are road and transit construction projects. This obviously affects um, traffic and it affects the commute for people. So right now we have um, a couple of current road and transit projects in the works. Um, in Richfield, it's the 77th Street underpass is, um, is underway and, and continues construction in the winter months. When completed, which is projected to be complete in 2023 in the fall, the underpass will connect 77th Street East and West of Trunk Highway 77 um, and eliminate a gap in the minor reliever network. Um, the project will connect Bloomington and Longfellow Avenues and address regional traffic issues on the 494 corridor through Richfield and Bloomington. Um, there's also what I'm sure you've heard of the Metro Green Line extension, also known as Southwest LRT. Um, there's you know, been an update in recent months about the project regarding budget and timeline. We have details of that if you're interested. Construction can, continues through the winter months and we can send you an email update about that project. Um, the big project that is on the horizon is, is the 494 Airport to 169 project. Our staff attends meetings every month about the project. So we, we are really in tune with what's happening. Um, you're invited to a virtual listening session on March 1st to provide feedback on design concepts for phase one. And the phase one is tentatively scheduled for construction for summer 2023 through fall 2026. So it is a three-year construction timeline as of now. Um, the 494 Airport to 169 Project Division is long-term to address the current and future transportation issues along the nine and a half segment of um, the 494 corridor from Highway 169 to Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. Um, due to its size and funding restrictions, um, the overall vision is broken into four separate construction projects to span several years. So project one, um, includes a new flyover ramp at 35W and 494 and a westbound easy pass lane from 35W to Highway 100, a new eastbound easy pass lane from Highway 100 to 35W and changes to access and construction of new bridges um, at, North, at Nicollet Avenue, Portland Avenue and 12th Street. Um, so project one is currently in the environmental review process and finalizing preliminary designs. 
So that is moving along on schedule. And again, it's pro projected to start construction um, next summer. So you can sign up for email alerts that Computer Services sends out about all of these projects. So just reach out to me and um, go to our website and we will get you signed up for email alerts for any of the projects that you are interested in. So now we're just gonna go through some of the um, detailed resources for commuters, for individual um, employees. We can provide um, a customized transit itinerary. So it shows bus stops and gives step-by-step -step instructions on how to get from home to work by bus, um, including transfer information and schedules. And um, we give a couple of free ride passes as well. Um, there's the Guaranteed Ride Home Program, which is free to anyone who is using a non-commute mode, non-drive alone commute mode about three days a week on average. And one of those modes is telework. So if for the hybrid workers, they can count their telework days as, as adding up to that three-day minimum. Um, it provides reimbursement for situations where um, commuters don't have their car and they need to get home to pick up a sick child or um, they have to work late unexpectedly. So they can use um, Uber, Lyft, uh, a taxi, uh, a car rental, and they can get home and get reimbursed up to $100 a year. Um, I talked about carpool, vanpool matching and tips that we can provide. We have bike to work materials and trail construction updates and try it campaigns. And um, we encourage commuters to sign up for our monthly commuter newsletter and request our resources on our website. And then I'll just go through some of the, some of the things that we can provide for, for different modes. We have a wealth of resources to help commuters look into biking to work. Um, they can sign up for bike trail updates. We keep track of new construction and detours and, um, and let you know what, what's happening with the bike trail updates in the Metro. Um, we have produced several on-demand bike commuting webinars about biking to work, how to. Uh, we have one about biking in, or in, in weather that's, that's cold or rainy or winter um, called extending your commute for people who are ready to, to bike to work um, in different weathers different weather. Um, we have information about how to put your bike on transit that I mentioned before. We have a bike commuting guide with tips for riding in traffic. Um, Hennepin County bike map is offered to anyone who's interested. And we have clothing recommendations and a winter bike commuting handout. So lots of different resources for biking to work. We have transit resources for commuters as well. Um, I talked about the customized um, bus and train route itinerary. There's also a program um, called TAP or Transit Assistance Program, and it's available for lower income residents and it offers um, a $1 ride um, for, each, for each trip. And there are eligibility requirements. We can provide information about that program. And we have the Metro system brochure and the transit system map, and we have schedules and all kinds of information. And then we've definitely focused more on, on how people are gonna get to work going to the brick and mortar work site, but we do also have a wealth of resources for telework. And over the past couple of years, we've really enhanced and developed our offering for employers and for teleworkers and managers through the Twin Cities Telework by Commuter Services program. And you can find all of the information and resources at tctelework.com. Um, we help companies formalize telework and hybrid work through um, sample policies and sample teleworker agreement. We have guidance on implementing a pilot and setting up a formal program. Um, we consult on best practices. We have training for managers on how to manage remote workers. We have a newer feature called Ask the Expert. So that's right on our website and you can ask any kind of telework related question and we will have an expert get back to you. Uh, we also have 
on-demand webinars, several of those that you can find um, the, the recording and slide decks on our website. We have created mental health tips for teleworkers, ergonomic and home office recommendations, mental health and ergonomic um, topics are topics that we've heard from commuters and employers over and over that these are, are issues that they would like more resources on. So we've developed resources for both of those. We also recently re developed um, a resource for managers and teleworkers on fear of missing out, which is something that we, we hear about as well. Um, you know, fear of, of teleworkers missing out on what's happening at the office and how managers can help with that and how teleworkers can, can overcome that. And then we have a quarterly newsletter um, that is the Twin Cities Telework Newsletter. And our next webinar is about home office ergonomics. It's on March 18th. Michelle is busy working on that. And we have a great lineup um, of speakers for, for that webinar. So you can watch for an invitation that will be coming soon. So that gives you a lot of information, um, overview of the different programs and, and strategies and resources that we can provide. And we hope that it's been helpful and we would love to hear questions and help answer those questions. And I know, Michelle, you're going to facilitate that. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, so far, and this is just to get the ball rolling because I know everybody out there has more questions for us. Um, Greg posed the question uh, asking if there are any new developments um, or policy changes at the federal or state level, making commuter incentives more financially manageable for employers, um, or if there are expansion of individual or business tax offsets or deductions, et cetera. And um, the first thing that came to my mind uh, was the, um, the qualified transportation fringe benefit, which in late December was um, adjusted at the federal level. Um, QTFB, Kate, help me out with this. It's a, it, it, yeah. it um, is the amount that... Um, that it's qualified. Um, What's the total amount it's it, it it the um it's the amount that companies can um it allows both employers and employees to receive tax benefits for um sustainable commute programs Right, so it's for transit passes and vehicle right. expenses and parking expenses as well. And in um, late, yeah, late last year, the the QTFB, the, the benefit amount was brought up ten dollars a month to an increase to be two hundred and eighty dollars per month. So that is one way. And then also the other thing that came to mind initially was within the Build Back Better Act, there is a, um, a new substitute built in there. Oh, there we go, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a new substitute in there for um, up to $900 on an electric bicycle valued, I think between three and $4,000. There's probably some other things that are shaking out. Um, and, and we can look into that yeah. and, and maybe include that in a, a future newsletter or send you information, Greg. Yeah. Um, because I think there may be, you know, some other things happening locally. There's there's Move Minnesota that does advocacy um, at the Capitol on, you know, inc increasing options and, and benefits. So that's something that we can track. So I hope that helps a little bit, but we can get, get back to you on that. Yeah, yeah, there's there's stuff out there. It's just a matter of kind of trying to pull that together right now. Is there, are there any other questions? So again, reach out to, to us and send an email if, uh, if you 
have questions that come up and um, we are happy to help. We are here to help and we're excited to sort of and hopeful that the next few months will will really truly we'll see some return to work and we'll be able to you know get things moving again with commute programs um, in, a, in a real way. <laughs> You can, any other questions, Michelle? I don't see any. I mean, this okay. is happening stuff, so I'm surprised by that. <laughs> well, you get about 10 minutes more time. We appreciate you attending and um, again, reach out to us with, with any questions or comments and we will end it here, but have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you.